five seconds. Good evening, geography teachers. Uh, welcome to another Jog Chat Live. This evening, we are here with Kate Stockings, who is going to be sharing her vision for a post-COVID curriculum. So Kate's going to take us through her thoughts for what her approach is going to be to tackling her curriculum now that we've returned to face-to-face uh, -face -to -face learning. So without much further ado, I will hand it over to Kate. Thanks, Paul. And um, yeah, as the title on the screen says, I'm going to talk about adapting our curriculum post lockdowns, plural, obviously, as we just come out of lockdown three. And the title is we can't do it all. So what are we going to do? So I'm Kate Stockings, Head of Geography at Hampstead School in London. The summer term is rapidly approaching um, and for some of our students the end of Key Stage 3 is nigh. So what are we going to do? How are we going to best use the summer term? And how are we going to make sure that the geography we do from now until July, ahead of hopefully a new year without disruptions, is the very best geography possible? Now, disclaimer, this session is obviously pretty con um, context dependent and it depends on what you've been able to provide for your students during lockdown one and lockdown three. And I think my situation is pretty similar to most in that in lockdown one, uh, if we're being honest, there probably wasn't too much good geography taking place, whereas lockdown three was much better. So in lockdown three, we were fully on teams. We were doing some live lessons. We were using Oak National and um, we were really doing some good learning. But even in lockdown three, our attendance was much, much lower than we'd expect in the classroom. So we have to remember that and account for the fact that a large number of our students are likely to have not done much specific geography from January to March, where we are now. So I just wanted to kind of make that disclaimer at the start, because if you have provided an exceptional curriculum um, since this time last year, this might not be so relevant to you. Um, but the decisions we need to make on the summer term are dependent on what's gone before us. So this slide outlines um, some of the key questions that I think we need to be asking at the moment. Now, obviously, these things are not mutually exclusive, and you can, of course, prioritise reigniting a love of geography whilst also boosting conceptual understanding. But if we look at the second question, I think a lot of us might be in the situation where we did make tweaks and we need to reflect on the impact that's had. So, for example, um, we didn't continue with our normal curriculum plan after Christmas as lockdown three began. Because of workload and because of spreading the load around the department, we use the fantastic Oak National resources with some key stage three groups. So whilst year nine were planned to do globalisation, instead we did Russia. This means that our students have done different content and are going to be able to do different links to what they have in the past. And some of the links we do in the past are not going to be possible because they haven't done the content. So when we're considering these questions, I think we once again come back to one of my kind of favourite graphics from the GA, which is the idea of curriculum making. And here we're talking about curriculum making in the really short term. But I want to refer to this graphic to highlight the importance of teacher choice in these conversations about adapting your curriculum um, in the summer term. So whatever you prioritise from now until July, I think it's really, really important to put teacher choice at the fore because it is us as the classroom teachers who are going to deliver the curriculum and bring it alive. So, of course, we are putting the students at the fore of what we're doing and we're thinking about what's important for them. But what do we want to teach as staff to really inspire and engage and progress our students as much as possible? Because this has been really important for me to consider and I'll explain why shortly. So others have kind of considered this idea of how to adapt their curriculum going forward. And this blog from Katie Water on the Oxford Education blog shares her thoughts. 
And Katie talks about how she's going to keep the great geography going at the heart of her lessons and how she's going to use um, the 14 key questions on this worksheet to ensure that students have really grasped the key geographical ideas that they covered during lockdown. So I'd highly recommend reading this blog and seeing some other people's opinions, but I'm briefly going to talk through what we've decided and my thought process about our curriculum going forwards. So here's our normal curriculum. When I say normal, it's normal for 2018, 2019, which was the last time we taught it in its entirety. And the colour coding are our eight key concepts that run through our key stage three curriculum. I've spoken about this in depth in various other webinars, and I've put the links at the end of the presentation if that's the first time you've come across um, this idea of, of mapping out the key concepts. So that's our normal curriculum. That's what I would have liked to have taught. But when we compare this to what our year nines have actually done, it's pretty different. And some of the fundamental topics have been missed. And some, some of the topics that we haven't covered are extremely important foundations for GCSE. So if you teach the EdXLB, you'll recognise that probably how is the UK changing in year eight is where we cover a large amount of our UK content to contextualise some of the bigger geographical ideas to the UK. We didn't study that. You will also notice that we skipped who does globalisation benefit. Now, if you're familiar with Edexcel GCSEB, you'll see how these two topics are really important stepping stones for our GCSE content. And that's not to say that we cover the same content, but they cover the key concepts of globalisation, interdependence and sustainability that I'd argue are essential for students to be really familiar with before they start their GCSE. But they weren't covered. We couldn't do it. We weren't set up in lockdown one. Um, and as I say, even in lockdown three, our attendance means that we can't assume that um, all of our students have done that. So what's been decided then? Well, from now until the Easter holidays, all of our key stage three students are doing three hours of census lessons. Why? Well, we were coming back to school for two and a half weeks before the Easter holidays. And I strongly feel that this once in a school uh, career event is fantastic geography and really can inspire our students to pursue geography further. Hopefully through learning about the census, I think they're going to see the bigger picture and understand why our subject is so important. But there are issues with this and um, we are repeating the same lessons over and over. So some staff will be repeating this to numerous, numerous key stage three classes. I have checked with them um, and we kind of all agreed that the importance of the census meant we felt we should do that. So until Easter, all year seven, eight and nine are going to do that. So when we come back from Easter, this is where our changes start to take effect. Year seven will do the almighty dollar. Why? Well, I want to get year seven back to normal as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And I'm hoping, obviously, that no further deviation will occur. So they can do this topic. I believe it's really good geography. Staff and students really enjoy it. And year seven can kind of get back on track. Not a problem. Year eight are also going to do the almighty dollar. Why? Well, we can't do it all. We can't cover every topic that they should have done in year seven and eight. But... I think this is excellent geography and I think it draws so many links to what they've done in year seven and to what their future year nine topics are that it's an essential stepping stone. The issue, of course, is that staff are then going to be teaching that to two cohorts, which is possibly confusing and possibly dull. That's where the idea of teacher choice as a key part of this thought process really comes in. And again, it's been discussed with staff um, and a belief that actually we're happy to do that because they're topics we enjoy, they're topics we find inspiring and that we really enjoy bringing to life for our students. The real decision was over what to do with year nine, because as much as it pains me to remove superpowers and globalization from this cohort, I think we need to do the Jamaica scheme of work because it's our really powerful synoptic key stage three unit. Now, the issue is that our lessons are going to have to be tweaked because the same links that we normally draw that draw back on that content of globalization and superpowers, the students haven't covered. They instead did Russia based on the open national lessons. 
So we aren't going to be able to draw the same links. And we're going to have to go through that process of for one year only thinking about how their conceptual understanding is perhaps different and the core knowledge that they bring to that scheme of work is slightly different. So that's our plan. And what have I considered to get there? Well, impact on staff, number one. And that's where we come back to that graphic. What will these changes mean for staff workload and for staff teaching patterns? Because a really important part of being a happy teacher is enjoying what you're teaching. And I think for anybody thinking about making tweaks over the next term, you know, I urge you to discuss it with the team and really make sure it's a thought process that everyone's on board with. And some of these discussions are still yet to happen in our department. Next one, conceptual understanding then. Which schemes of work can you not skip? Which schemes of work develop that essential conceptual understanding that you can't miss out? And that, of course, means that others will miss out, but you're making a judgment there over the ones that are the most important, I suppose which is difficult to do when we all believe that all the geography we teach is obviously highly important. Geographical knowledge. So which scheme of work embeds and retrieve previous geographical knowledge that are taught through synoptic links? And that, for me, is why I do feel we have to do Jamaica with Year 9, because that is a really important a scheme of work to draw together everything across key stage three and so if we are sending our students off to be GCSE geographers or indeed to stop their study of geography then I think they have a right to have drawn it together and seen the big picture and see how it all coherently comes together before they leave us if they're dropping the subject. And then enjoyment. What are our staff and students going to enjoy in this second disrupted academic year? Because it is once again a year that has not quite gone as planned. It's once again a year where due to the digital divide, due to lack of resources and individual circumstances, some students have had a really heavily impacted year. So what are we going to do to make sure that the students enjoy their subjects and reignite that passion and also the staff enjoy it? Because because, you know, you're sitting here watching on a Wednesday evening. Uh, it's probably been a long week already and we've still got a long way to go. And we need to be on kind of our, our top form in order to teach the very, very best geography possible. So I've kind of whizzed through that in 15 minutes and realised there's a lot of time left. Um, but I'm hoping people might have some questions um, or some things to ask or some ideas to share. What are you going to do to adapt your curriculum? What thought process have you already had? What questions have you still got to answer? And when I share these slides shortly, I will put the links to those blogs and the webinars as well. So um, Paul, are there any questions that anyone has posted or are we short on questions? Um, I thought of a few myself, so please do um, start tweeting in your questions or adding them to the chat. So I do have a few myself here, Kate, um, that I was thinking about depending on the context of some departments. So. I would imagine some departments are feeling like really under a lot of pressure right now, especially now that we've got um, teacher assessed grades to think about how we're going to collate the evidence for that. Um, and then obviously everything else on top of that and teachers really want to really do best for their students. So what kind of advice do you think should uh, departments be taking on how much to handle when they're thinking about the curriculum? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really interesting question. And actually, I've been thinking about that a lot this week because I was concerned about doing the same lessons to all of Key Stage 3 with the census. Um, concerned because I'm not the one that's impacted because I do a lot of Key Stage 4 and Key Stage 5. I actually only teach three different Key Stage 3 classes, but some colleagues will be teaching that same lesson like nine times over. But what I've actually realised is by repeating the same lessons for the next two weeks, it's had a really positive impact on workload because you are spinning one scheme of work um, at the moment. So that is allowing us the time to think about year 11 CAGs, to think about year 13, to do the big picture stuff that we need to do at the moment. So I think in terms of adapting your curriculum, it's thinking about workload and thinking about how you can balance teaching excellent geography and balancing workload. And they obviously don't have to be two distinct things. Um, I've realised this week that actually, yeah, OK, I was worried that staff would get bored of teaching the same to all of Key Stage 3 as a one off. But actually, there's definitely been advantages of it because it has allowed us a little bit of breathing space and a little bit of time. Um, 
I think the same might occur when we do the almighty dollar to year seven and year eight. I have concerns there that we'll start at different times because year seven are going to do another project. So um, staff will be kind of balancing like lesson one with year seven, lesson six with year eight, et cetera. But uh, I'm going to run it past them and just double check we are OK to do that. And hopefully, again, that's going to have a positive impact on workload at a time when I know we're going to be bringing home year 11 papers, year 13 papers and doing all that kind of stuff. So I think it's about reflecting on where your team are and how you can best use the people in the team and best, um, you know, spread the load to make it as as easy as possible, really definitely agree with that I think just in terms of subject knowledge as well like the the possibility of overlapping them together really allows teachers to really thrive so really like you know produce questions with really strong questioning because you've seen how students cope with particular types of questions and then thinking about how you probe deeper as well so I think like that would be fantastic for improving your subject knowledge and then also really judging the waters for how students are handling it and how you handle it with your next class so completely agree there. Um, how deep do you think schools should be looking at interleaving that lockdown content? So some, some schools will obviously have very good engagement and then other schools will be in a, a lot worse in terms of um, kind of scenarios. So how deep do you think schools should actually be interleaving their lockdown learning? Yeah, it's really difficult because I said to my colleagues, kind of, let me know some kids who have really engaged in Key Stage 4, so in Year 10 and 11, and we'll reward them. And we were going to give them a pack of the EdXLB revision cards. And one of the team just said to me, well, hang on, Kate, aren't we just rewarding those then with more resources that already had the best resources? And I was like, oh, yeah, you've kind of got a point. We're rewarding those that were fully there and fully engaged with this additional learning resource, which is the revision cards. That was their prize. But they were the most engaged because they had the resources and they had, you know, technology that meant they could get on and stuff like that. So that really made me think. Um, and it, I think it's difficult because you don't want to pretend that lockdown learning didn't happen. And you don't want to not acknowledge it because some students worked exceptionally hard and really deserve to have that learning recognised. But equally, some disappeared through no fault of their own. And some have missed a couple of months and missed several, several lessons through no fault of their own. Um, and it's really, really difficult to get that balance right. We, to be honest, are not really counting on that learning. We will draw links. So if year nine are being taught, we'll talk about Russia, we'll talk about the tiger forest, we'll talk about ecosystems that they studied using those oak lessons. Year eight did the Congo and development scheme of work on oak. And again, we will draw links there, but we're not making it an integral part of the curriculum just because in our context, we can't. Um, and our attendance, our engagement wasn't good enough to do that. Now that's obviously not the same for everybody. And for some people that had different contexts where every lesson was live and attendance was really rigorously um, monitored, they will have a completely different context. The only thing I would say though, post lockdown is my year eights completely took me by surprise yesterday because when you're learning online, you go on, I'm gonna do my geography. Yep, yeah, I'm doing some geography. I've done a bit, tick, submitted, done. And they were like, had that mentality in the classroom. They're like, yeah, miss, I've done. I was like, no, you're not. You might think you're done, but that's not what I'm calling done. And then that's really taken me by surprise this week. Actually, we need to rebuild some resilience and pretty quickly. Um, and we need to rebuild our expectations, not around behavior and not around wanting to learn because they absolutely, absolutely do want to learn in my experience. They absolutely are there to lap up the knowledge, but they've kind of forgotten the expectations of full sentences, basic grammar because punctuation disappears online apparently and then things like that so that for me is what we really have to work on and if that means leaving the past knowledge that some did and some didn't do behind then so be it really so this this is definitely linked to your your short and medium term planning how how do you expect this to go into the long term like how long do we think um you'll be kicking this into the grass before you go i want to get back to the curriculum that i envisioned for my school and i've been crafting for years september is back to normal 
um so if i just get up the normality september oh, no there we go september um each year will pick up with where they were which is why year eight are doing the almighty dollar because they missed it in year seven so year eight will do the almighty dollar that means they won't have done how the uk is changing they're going to do the almighty dollar instead and then in year nine they'll do brazil is an emerging country um earthquakes and volcanoes globalization superpowers in jamaica we might sub one of those out for the uk um because it might not be obvious there but in that uk one is where they do their coasts it's where they talk about migration diversity that kind of stuff so we might sub that but that's later down the line the current plan is september for normality absolutely brilliant um i've got a comment here on youtube um what do you think about the phrase recovery curriculum oh no no, I'm going to be exposed. Um, I, I, everything I've read about the recovery curriculum at the moment is lacking a bit of weight for me. It's a bit kind of fluffy, um, which I know it's meant to be. But for me, it's just they're back in the classroom. Let's be explicit about what we need to achieve now. And that is about having a conversation about where they are. And that was me coming into the office yesterday going, oh my goodness, my year eights are not where I left them. And that's for me as a subject specialist to rebuild that now. Where were they before December and how do I get them back up to that? Now, if you want to call that recovery work, recovery restoration, call it what you want. For me, it's just good teaching now we're back in the classroom. But I don't really want to be having conversations about you know recovery curriculum if that takes me away from teaching the best geography possible with the kids in front of me where I've worked out what they need to do as a professional and as a subject specialist so I'm going to sit on the fence with that one I'm afraid because it's it's not really me based on what I've seen on it so far if anyone wants to send me a fantastic article that absolutely persuades me that I should be using that language fire away um, I do I do like that someone online has said um, they prefer to call it a bounce back curriculum in the school. I think it sounds a lot more positive as well, especially when you're uh, letting students know that that's the vision in, ter in terms of the plan as well. Right, we know that the bread and butter of geography really is um, field trips. So how are you trying to incorporate field work? Is that something that's still a kind of no go for you or what's the plan? Well, field, field work remained on my long term to do list. Field work has been on my to do list for five years. And um, key stage three field work is not something that we have properly nailed by any stretch of the imagination. And obviously, that's kind of come to a, a halt at the moment. Um, in terms of getting that up and running, as soon as we're allowed to, I'll be back out. And um, one thing I really really love doing is kind of outreach sessions and getting people in to speak to students and that's impacted for me more to be honest um because we haven't been able to do that because we haven't been able to get the co whole cohort in an assembly and of course there are fantastic things going on with teams going on with um speakers i don't think it's the same as sitting in a in a room listening to someone inspire you so as soon as possible we'll be back to um field work but not yet, but I'm always honest and always say that key stage three field work is not something I is entry at, and I need to tackle it and get better at it definitely. Um, what about online learning? So, what about like the advantages of having those kind of online resources, Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom? Is that something that you think still has a really primary role in the curriculum? Yeah, that chat is from my old boss, who's a historian, who's lurking. <laughs> I saw it pop up on Twitter. And um, so hi, Tom. Um, yeah, I think before COVID, um, we were quite behind in terms of our technology. We use Show My Homework. Um, and I must confess, when they said that Show My Homework was going to be replaced by Teams, I was like, why? I love Show My Homework. Hold still, Show My Homework. Um, but obviously, we've, we've now had to learn the full capabilities of some other platforms. And they definitely do have potential. Um, I want to keep using them. I particularly want to keep using them with the older ones and putting all the resources up there and giving them a backlog that they can work through. Um, what I've realised this week is you've got to balance that with organisation because obviously that's another thing to spin is, right, is it all on Teams? You know, are the kids that aren't here, can they catch up, have a scan to in? And um, so definitely potential. I think the problem for me is 
I still don't feel like I fully know how that's going to work when they're back in the classroom without creating a bigger workload for me, because I don't want the expectation of leaving at the end of the school day and then going away on teams and that still being that dynamic interaction on teams because then we get a risk of teachers never switching off if they're going home and seeing teams notifications coming in in the evening so i'm not sure how it's going to pan out yet but yeah definitely want to keep using teams and as i say for the older ones keeping that backlog of resources for them to work through independently and do extra reading which kind of remains the you know holy grail of could they do it well it's a lot easier now if we can signpost them resources to do independently Absolutely. And it's about, again, building up the resilience again, that's uh, sort of evaporated away. Um, that was your line manager who, your previous line manager who asked the uh, bound recovery curriculum as well. I think he's trying to catch you out. Um, yeah, he knows my personal opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um, final question from me. Um, some schools will feel like they need to reteach what they, they did during lockdown. So for some schools, it'll be repeating a lot of the learning that happened during lockdown what kind of approach do you think they should take with that, especially when worrying about engagement from those who did engage during lockdown versus the kids who kind of came back as well and were not as engaged during it? Yeah, I think it, it comes back to, you know, balancing these three things, the student experience and teacher choice. Um, if you are going to recap all of that learning, how are you going to ensure that it's inspiring and engaging for all? And that includes the teacher who has already taught it online, I assume, in a live lesson. So if you're gonna, if you're going to recap it all, how are you gonna balance those things? Now, there are so many different answers to that question. Perhaps you're gonna do it in a different way, perhaps you're gonna include more hinterland knowledge that you didn't do before perhaps you're going to do the opposite and strip it right back to the core knowledge but whatever you're going to do how are you going to make that work um it's not an approach that jumps out to me as something i'd want to do just because my narrative i think is we haven't got time to do it all so what are we going to do so therefore recapping to me feels um you know going over the the same ground but i can see why people would do it and um, i think it depends on your context and what your lockdown was like which is a bit of a cop-out answer but i think it depends on what what you did and how well you did it now if we had continued to teach all of our normal topics um we probably would have to do a lot more recapping but we didn't. We went completely off piece because of workload um, and balancing it. And therefore now it's like, right, OK, we went off piece, but how are we going to get back on the piece? If I want to pick this up from September, how are we going to get back on track to enable them to do that with with the knowledge they've got? So very, very context dependent, I think. And I think it's about talking as a department and working out what works best for you as a team and your context. Um, with a minute to spare there, Kate. Uh, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed and uh, found a lot of food for thought there. Um, I know there's plenty of ideas already generating with me and how we're going to think about Key Stage 3 going forward. So as always, definitely continue the chat over on Twitter. Um, you know where to find Kate. Um, so I'll say thank you very much for us and we'll see you again next